Betsy, do you find that um, some Christians would be puzzled that we would put together psychology and spiritual formation? Or do you, um, in other words, do you think some Christians who are interested in spiritual formation might have a kind of suspicion about psychology and maybe not put those two things together? Or what is it that informs the project here? I think actually the church probably has a better idea of what psychology is than spiritual formation mm, is right now. Very good, yeah. And you know, for me, they're overlapping disciplines with, uh, and both developmental in nature. Um, both come straight out of a creation mandate of, you know, God created us to be certain ways. Absolutely. So spiritual formation, of course, is by far the more ancient yeah. discipline. Um, but I think the church probably has a better handle on psychology overall than spiritual formation by that name. Yeah. D do you mean... Um there's something about calling, say, talking about spiritual formation as opposed to, say, discipleship. Discipleship or progressive sanctification. Um, many of the things we do in spiritual formation go beyond traditional discipleship. We certainly begin there. It's a necessary but perhaps not sufficient um, trajectory for our lives in Christ. In, in some ways, would you say, you know, the ancient church fathers and mothers were, in a sense, Christian psychologists. They had insights. Maybe they, they maybe it wasn't evidence-based. Maybe it wasn't underwritten by the kind of social scientific research that we have. But in a way, they had intuitions about human nature and formation that we can still learn from well, today. Well, certainly the sages, the biblical wisdom literature, the desert fathers and mothers, yeah. absolutely. And I'm always impressed. Uh, my mom's 93. She's been walking with the Lord since she was 12. Mm. Um, never had any counseling in her life, as far as I know. But a woman of the word and a woman of prayer and a, and a church lady, in a very real sense. And she is so well-formed psychologically at this point in her life by the word, by the church, by the work of the Holy Spirit mm. in the natural outflow of... Uh, what comes from life in Christ. Yeah, 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 that's great. I think where there may be um, some distinction in some Christians' mind between psychology and spiritual formation, there might be a suspicion of psychology as mm -hmm. being too internal, yeah. uh, mm. being too self-focused. And I know, Jamie, you have a concern about uh, uh, kind of the, the inter internal uh, view of kind of uh, Christian consciousness or, or a too kind of um, uh, what you sometimes call intellectualized view, uh, but maybe coming from a different way. So could you talk a little bit about, um, yeah. talk a little bit about how you see kind of the internal versus the body and... Uh, yeah, and maybe, um, maybe part of it is actually um, resisting the internal external dichotomy, right? <laughs> so, so recognizing that, I, I do think um, some Christians have a bit of a tendency to treat sanctification, becoming Christ-like, um, as if it were primarily an intellectual project, right? So it's about getting the right biblical knowledge and information in my mind and that I'm thinking biblically which of course is a wonderful thing to do. But I don't think that that actually touches the whole person because I think there are aspects of our being in the world that operate on the level of habit, imagination, um, and those govern the way we act and the way we live. And so if, I, I think a really holistic spiritual formation can't just be informing the intellect. It has to be forming our habits, forming our loves, forming our longings. And that happens um, not just by disseminating information to our minds, right? It's, it's recruiting our convictions in, in a, a more tangible way, a more visceral way. So I think that's why I talk about the body more. So the example of, of uh, many, though not all, of uh, contemporary churches, maybe especially but not only the evangelical church, is the kind of pride of place given to the 45-minute sermon Yeah. as an example right. of a kind of uh, over-intellectualizing of, of spiritual formation. 
Um, how did this, even historically, culturally, how did we come to a place where uh, formation uh, really kind of centered on correct belief, yeah. uh, the informational sermon, the 45 minute propositional uh, truth liturgy. Yes. Right. Yeah, how did, how, did right. this, how did this come to happen? And uh, you know, I'm presuming, I guess there was a time when that was not always the case. Um, yeah, and I mean, it, it's- That's a long and complicated no, no, story. No, 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 I mean, and it's important. And, and I don't, uh, um, I think we actually have to own up to the fact that there were some unintended byproducts of the Protestant Reformation mm -hmm. in this respect. Mm -hmm. And I think the ref I'm I'm a reformed Christian, so I think the Reformation was on the right track in correcting a very superstitious way of thinking about spiritual life that had kind of arisen in the late Middle Ages, and so you could see the emphasis on correction and therefore thinking correctly about what we're doing when we worship. Um, the the unfortunate byproduct of that I think was this overemphasis on ideas, beliefs, doctrines, propositional truth, as you put it, as if that was the entirety of what orients us. And so then you, you kind of effectively start thinking about human beings as if they were brains on a stick. And then you sort of set up Christian worship for that, which is a few songs, and then sit down, because we have to get as much information in your head as we can right now. So we need a 50-minute lecture to transfer all of that informational, propositional data into your mind. So I, I do think it's, um, in that respect, I think it's ironic how modern evangelicals are. Um, we don't realize how much we've absorbed a view of the human person that is a product of the Enlightenment, for example. Um, whereas ancient Christian intuitions about this were much more embodied, right? So the Desert Fathers knew, if, if I'm going to overcome the vice of gluttony, it's not a matter of making sure I hear the message and understanding the biblical passage that, that convicts me. That's good, I mean, that will be the start. But now I need rituals and regimens to undo my, my wanton lusts. So right? talk about cultural liturgies. Mm -hmm. Talk about mm -hmm. thick and thin liturgies and practices. That's some of, I just, that's so insightful. Yeah, so, so I, I tend to use the word liturgy fairly expansively to mean formative social practices that really touch our most fundamental longings and desires. And so that means there are cultural practices that function liturgically, right? They shape the very core of who we are without us realizing For an example. Well, I, I often like to pick on the mall, uh, just because I, I think the way you become a consumerist, right? The way you, you become convicted by the consumerist gospel is not because you get to the mall and somebody hands you a tract and says, here's the 16 things the mall believes. Here's our set of propositional tracts. Mm -hmm. It's not an intellectual exchange, but it is a tactile, visceral, embodied experience that over time, um, really is recruiting your heart, your loves and longings to, to long for this vision of flourishing, this version of the good life. And when you analyze that biblically, I think you'll see that it's a rival gospel. So um, we don't realize the extent to which practices are shaping our most fundamental orientation to God and the world. Uh, and that's because I actually think we have so emphasized the head and we are so worried about the messages in culture that are, run counter to a Christian worldview that we haven't picked up on the practices of a culture that run counter to a Christian imagination, a uh, Christian love, um, a biblical vision of what shalom is and what flourishing is. So um, those quote unquote secular liturgies are the kinds of practices that they might not be trying to convince you to think the wrong thing, but even worse, they're con they're capturing your imagination so you love the wrong things. Uh, and, that, and if we are what we love, that turns out to be a pretty fundamental disordering of who we are. And they do it through our bodies. So for example, when I walk into my local mall, I walk in through the Macy's entrance and I see beautiful shoes yeah. right off. I smell the whatever they're spraying in the Estee Lauder counter, and I also get a whiff of the Starbucks there, yes, right. and a blast of cool air hits me from the hot parking lot, and I walk in and I go, oh. Yes, that's very good. Now, when I walk into my church, 
I walk in and cooler air. I walk in and there's holy water there. Mm. And mm -hmm. I can dip my finger in and remind myself of my baptism in Christ. Yes. And I smell maybe some vestigial incense or I hear the choir practicing. Now that's another, that that sets a whole other chain. Totally. Um, and I'm But there. it's equally bodily, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, yeah. that's what, ever but since what I read But what you just described book, is not the common evangelical experience of showing up at church. I'm well, Anglican. And, and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, but, but what's interesting about what you're saying is the marketers and the sales folk and the manufacturers understand something about human anthropology Absolutely. that the church has lost. And the church might counter by saying, well, no, we don't want to become like them. We don't want to go for just the body and desire. We want to chiefly want to go for the mind. And I guess I want to ask you a little bit about that. I mean, uh, affect and the body and emotion, yep. you know, the, the body and affect are pretty closely tied together, have kind of been the awkward stepchild <laughs> of modern Christianity. It's kind of the embarrassed faculty that acts out mm -hmm. and disrupts <laughs> the mind. <laughs> right. um, but you, you, you re-understand affect as a tension and, and the positive role of affect, closely connected to the body, in yes. our formation. Can you talk about this yeah. re-understanding of emotion? Well, and, and what's interesting, I mean, on the one hand, I think that, that intuition comes out of my own Pentecostal charismatic background. So I would say one of the, one of the gifts of Pentecostal and charismatic Christianity is that it actually sort of revalues the emotion. Now. You, we could also have a conversation about how it perhaps overvalues emotion. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Okay. But at least it sort of says, oh, my emotions are also something that should be brought into alignment with what God desires for me. And th th those are a, a creational part of who I am. Um, uh, but interestingly, even someone like Jonathan Edwards, right? Totally. You know, uh, uh, probably still the most brilliant American theologian that has ever uh, written on this, this side of the Atlantic. Um, the affections are defining for us. Mm -hmm. I think you're totally right though, Todd, that um, marketers are our culture's most brilliant psychologists. They mm -hmm. understand how this works. They understand the kinds of creatures we are. And, and my worry is that they understand it much better than the church does, which is why it's so much more successful in forming us sometimes than, than the church is because, you know, marketing knows to appeal to the affections, not just to fool us, but because that's a legitimate part of who we are, right? Yes. And then the, the church might see what's wrong with that, but then we think that the solution is intellectual. And what we need are experiences like you just described, Betsy, which are worship experiences, spaces, practices that equally recruit our affections. Mm -hmm. um, and that happens, I would say, almost aesthetically, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you, you, the, everything you described there were all the senses. And, and it's interesting how historically worship was a much more visual, tactile, aesthetic experience. Not because it's pretty, but because that's how the story gets into your bones. Plus, yeah. there were most folks couldn't read, so the pictures had to be in the windows, yes. in the statues, in the practices, in the church year. Yes. Um, yes. In and Jesus, I mean, we're on such firm ground here. Yeah. You know, coming right out of the Old Testament, yeah. we have Jesus and baptism and feasts and touching and healing and posture and prayer. And as well as proclamation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And he fed people too. I mean, right. it's just, it's right. all there and right. it's ours. Right. The church just needs to take it back. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> it's not, and it's not that, for example, even propositional communication isn't important, but notice how even Jesus, so much of Jesus' propositional communication is embedded, say, in parables, yeah. which function narratively, and, and so they just work on a different register than merely processing data and information. Yeah, you know, let's talk about that because you're very sympathetic to a story and narrative and poetry and even the little stories of images and symbols yeah. that are contained in that. And, um, you know, again, your argument is that, uh, you know, that you believe that these things help fire our, our imagination yeah. and imagination recruits desire. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about this. You've been helped a lot by neuroscientists and, and some philosophers Good. in kind of re-understanding the role of imagination, even in kind of um, anchoring in us a worldview. We tend to think of the worldview as a more analytical yeah. kind of practice, but you say, no, the imagination is really kind of at the core of a worldview. Talk about how we need to understand the imagination. Yeah, and it's, it's tough because 
I, I'm sort of using the imagination as a word to name, I, I think maybe what other people would just call our intuitions about the world, right? But it's this, in other words, to imagine your world is to make sense of it pre-analytically. Maybe that's mm -hmm. a way of getting at it. You talk about also pre-consciously. And, and also pre-consciously. talk about it as a kind it of fair? unconscious. It is a kind of unconscious, right. We say, what I know by heart. Yeah, exactly. And yet it's not a hardwired thing, right? So we're not just, it, there's a biological platform on which this operates. Uh. And yet what we're talking about are habitual ways of learning how to perceive the world that often we don't articulate uh, and yet kind of govern our feel for the world. It's more like a know-how, right? Mm. And um, it just strikes me that a lot of recent research in neuroscience, cognitive science, even social psychology, I think kind of confirms a lot of ancient Christian intuitions about spiritual formation, which is this is a sort of know-how that you carry in your gut, that you learn, it's caught more than it's taught. Mm -hmm. Um, and yet, that doesn't mean that it's not intentional, um, you know, um, aimed at the world. It's, it's even its own kind of understanding, mm -hmm. um, but it, it builds on operations, I would say. I, I'm not a psychologist, so I'm always intimidated to, 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 to tread on your terrain here, but Go for it, it. it seems like uh, um, it's working on a register between body and mind. That's a, the, a French philosopher that I draw on a lot, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, makes a lot out of this sense of the between. Mm -hmm. the, it's, the imagination is between intellect and instinct, right? It's this sort of know-how that um, is built up over time. Uh, and sometimes you have to unlearn mm -hmm. things that you've acquired in your imagination. You have to learn how to reimagine mm -hmm. who you are what you are, and I think the reason why story is so important is, in some ways, Christian formation is the re-narration of our identity in Christ. Mm, yeah. And it's like all of us carry a story yeah, in yeah, our yeah. bones, and, and some of us actually have, have absorbed a story that's not true. Yeah. Yes. Right, we've, we've absorbed a false story. And these are the secular liturgies uh, that maybe you talk about. Yeah, and I mean, and, and, and the scary happen, thing is too, is it, it can, can happen, happen for church. Christians, yeah. right? I mean, you can be raised in the church and, and come from a really dysfunctional family context or really kind of toxic Absolutely. Christian context. Mm -hmm. and, and it turns out that you've absorbed a story that is other than the gospel story. Yeah. That's right. And so then what has to happen is, it, yes, you might intellectually grasp the, the, the good news of the gospel, but it might take a, an entire season of your life, it might take a lifetime right. to relearn at that imagination level that the Father loves you. Yeah. So this matter of the Father loves me. Yes. So we, all of us, I honestly think this is what scripture is gonna, when it talks about then we'll, now we see through a glass darkly, then we'll know as we're known. You know, it's that when we see him face to face, then we're going to go, oh, that's, that's you. Oh, that's me. Because mm. we'll see ourselves mm. mirrored in his eyes, and it will be the real us that he's been loving all along. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's beautiful. Psalm 8611 talks about, unite my heart that I may praise your name. So we're all living, to some extent, with a divided heart. Mm. Yes. We're all living under a false identity. Yeah. Now, to the extent that our parents were good enough parents, as Winnicott would say, and he, and so to the extent yeah. that our parents could care for the little people we were and tolerate our emotions and explain the world to us and train us, then when we come and hear the good news of the gospel, it's going to be good news. Yes. But I honestly know somebody who loves the Lord dearly and uh, came to me for spiritual direction, which is different than therapy. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about our prayer life. And so I uh, ask her, you know, when you talk to God about this, you know, how do you sense he's receiving you? And she said, oh, I would, I would never bring this up to God. Why would I want to call his attention to me? I'm just hoping when I die, he'll, he'll let me in. Mm -hmm. And so there we see how her, exactly what you're talking about, this early, the, the wrong message, the lie that she was given of, you know, your job is to be quiet and sit in the corner, yeah. and if you're lucky, we'll feed you. Yeah. 
And so then when she hears about God, she loves him. Yes. But she doesn't yeah. know him, and she certainly doesn't yeah. know the evil. Spirit. And it's almost like there can be a gap between your intellectual grasp of the gospel, which is absolutely crucial, and your sort of existential absorption of the reality of that good news. Your right? God concept versus your God image. Okay. Yeah. So I am interested in um, attachment theory myself. Yeah. And uh, of course, attachment theories emphasize the fact that our early formation. Uh, in relationship with our caregiver, our parent, um, really does kind of make such an imprint that it affects all future relationships, including our relationship with God. That our relationship with God initially is a kind of echo of whatever uh, our experience of relationships were early on, which means that you know we can sometimes have a distorted view of God if we had an um, inadequate yeah. caregiving. And I want to ask a little bit about that because I do have a theorist, uh, a friend of mine, attachment theorist in psychology, who says that. Basically, we have to be loved into loving. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we love because God first loved us. Yes. And so I want to ask a little bit about, uh, si since you're such a strong advocate of repeated practices, sometimes I hear that, well, God's kind of in the deep background of a practice. You know, we're doing the practice of prayer or the practice of confession. Yeah. And, you know, he's working on us kind of unaware. And, you know, we have good days and bad days, days we feel close to him, he didn't feel so close. But where for you is kind of the existential, relational, kind of psalmist-like interaction with God amid the practices. Uh, which practices kind of help us really attach to God relationally, not just as a kind of, merely as a kind of habit of practice? And, um, and where is this place for this kind of um, yeah. deep interaction with the person of God imme in immediacy, in relationship, amid yeah. these repeated practices? That's a great question. I mean, um, I, I want to say, almost any of those practices will at different moments be thin places in nice. which the Father is met in the Son in ways that will um, take me by surprise, you know? So, yeah, I don't want us to paint a picture of sort of liturgical practices, Christian worship practices, where we're just sort of going through the motions and God is kind of elsewhere. I, it's funny. Um, to give an example, so in my tradition, um, worship always ends with a benediction, where we are sent from worship now to take up our image-bearing task in culture. And it's a charge, but it's also a blessing, right? And so, and the pastor will raise his or her hands and, and bless us. And um, uh, I'm, I'm interested in the attachment theory because I come from actually a really messed up family. Mm -hmm. And, and have never known the love of a father. Mm -hmm. And um, what I do is whenever the benediction is offered, I hold out my hands to receive it mm -hmm. because that's the only father who has ever said, I bless you. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, I, I think some people might look at that as like this really formal liturgical thing. For me, that is a thin place. You huh. know, that's, that's, a, that's an experience and of is there a is there a conversation that even takes place at that moment sometimes with you? Like you, oh, you hold out your hand oh, and it's kind of like, yeah. uh, Lord, I need you. I mean, what is the... Abs yeah, I mean, and I, I suppose probably it makes a difference. I, I almost enter these liturgical practices differently probably because my affections were also cultivated by charismatic sure. experience, oh, right. Sure. right? And so there's a, it's just that it breeds a sense of intimacy. I bet that's not true of everyone. You know, maybe if somebody was a kind of cradle Lutheran and all they've ever done is gone through these, these rhythms, they might not experience the intimacy in the same way that I'm looking yeah, for it yeah, there yeah. because of those other past experiences. Yeah, right. It's funny, I mean, also, it, it might be really weird, but for me, the regular ritual of confession and assurance of pardon is, uh, for me, um, a deeply intimate mm -hmm. meeting of a father who um, I have to be honest with and mm -hmm. who says, I forgive you mm -hmm. every God single time. God is right there. Time. Yeah. He's right there. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think one of the things, that it, it, you're on, this is a really great question, and, and it, I don't have all the answers to it, because I, but I think it's worth thinking about more, because I think culturally, we've absorbed certain standard tropes of intimacy, or certain repertoires uh -huh. of in intimacy, and therefore we, we foster certain kinds of worship experiences that we think breed intimacy. And I think we might not realize that 
inti intimacy will look different for different people. Mm -hmm. Um, if that if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and you know a couple times in your conversation you use the example of, of laying the hands out Yeah, and I just want you to take a moment to talk about how is Confessing like this. Oh, yeah different from yeah, or, or the benediction was the example. Yes. How is the benediction? Yeah different for you. Yeah, and why from just kind of holding my hands down and putting my hands out So now we're using the body. Yes uh, Why is that important and why does it make sense that there's a bodily practice that ought to be, in some cases, uh, connected to this relational or liturgical. I, I think practice. it's a, it's um, again, it's a psalmist intuition here, right? That that we are ensouled bodies and embodied souls, and we we are um, uh, th there's something spiritually that happens in the posture of my body because I am my body. Do you know what I mean? I'm not just a soul trucking around in this vehicle. I am also my body. You're not a ghost in the machine only. No, exactly. And so for me, this is, uh, um, this is a tangible, holistic expression of a posture that I'm also trying to cultivate spiritually. But I'll also be honest, you know what? There's lots of Sundays I don't feel like doing this. It's not expressive. Do you know what I mean? It's not, oh, oh, I'm, I'm doing this to show that I'm open to the Father. Sometimes I'm doing it to try to make myself open so to the Father. So this is one of your practices. Yeah, it, and, and the body leads the spirit in a way in this regard. Mm -hmm. you, 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 um, it's a little bit like belonging before believing. Yes. It's acting <laughs> before I'm, I'm uh, um, there spiritually So sometimes. it's acting as if, and yet I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, and yet this is the Holy Spirit's life in him. Sure. This is the, the Trinity has I come and so. made yeah. his home in you, and therefore it, it makes a difference yeah. in what you right. do. Right, right. The same reason why, you know what, some days I don't feel like raising my hands in praise, but the Bible commands it, and I, and I get it. It's almost like your body can be ahead of the curve of mm -hmm. where your spirit needs to be, and so you practice your way into that posture. So. So talk a little bit about private prayer versus corporate mm, prayer. Mm. What's the difference between me, myself, in, in my prayer closet, yeah. my prayer chair, or me and all my brothers and sisters who I love or don't love, know or don't know, and know stuff about, and now we're here doing something with our bodies together. Which interesting, we call the body of Christ. So, totally. So yeah, right. talk about what does it have to be doing some of these practices with other bodies uh, yeah, oh, and, yeah, and yeah. alone. So. so talk about that. I mean, bit. do you mean, I, I certainly think there's something at stake when we gather communally in these worship practices. We can do something collectively that we couldn't do individually. Something. So it's not, it's not just, the gathering of the, of the body of Christ is not just a collection of individuals who are now having their own private relationship with God. It, it, is, it is the forging of a people who now are acting communally and collectively. Uh, I'll give you one example. Um, and again, I, I come from a fairly liturgical tradition. So in worship every week, we would say the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You're talking about your Reformed tradition. You're in not the Reformed tradition, right? No, yeah, okay. in the Reformed tradition. They have a different creed. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, one of the things I sometimes tell my kids to do is, you know what, some weeks, just listen to everybody else saying the creed. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want, I want them to say it. But some weeks, actually, the oral experience of hearing all of these saints surrounding me professing their faith and I'm part of them, there will be weeks when I need them to believe for me, right? That's just being honest about the ups and downs of, of, a, of a progressive sanctified life is recognizing, you know what? There are some weeks where I'm kind of not there and yet I'm there. <laughs> so that's a first conviction. And, and there's something about hearing the body singing praises to Christ that itself happens for me. Um, and I think that communal aspect is, Im is important. Yeah. We were hearing somebody talk about grieving. Mm. And they talked at the table earlier um, this semester. And they were talking about when I couldn't pray, the church prayed for me. Absolutely. When I couldn't sing, the church sang for me. The hardest spiritual experience I've ever had, or one of, uh, our niece 
Sophie died very suddenly and tragically when she was 17 months old. Mm. And our fam extended family come from a very free church tradition. I'm not a pastor, I'm not ordained, uh, but Deanna's sister and her husband asked if I would help officiate the funeral. This, is, this was a nightmare. I'll bet. And um, we got to the final song, and we were going to sing In Christ Alone, which some folks might be familiar with. And I looked down at Jen and Luke and said to them, we're not asking you to sing. Mm -hmm. We can't possibly expect you to sing. We will sing for you. And that, that's the body mm -hmm. acting out. Sometimes, this is why I think sometimes our liturgies lead us to places that we couldn't get to on our own, Absolutely. right? They are invitations. Uh, into a spiritual place that we couldn't muster on our own willpower. It's one of the reasons why even individually, if you think of it in your prayer closet. So again, this isn't sort of maybe typical evangelical piety, but for me, it's things like the divine hours or the book of common prayer that I receive as a gift for my personal spirituality because um, I, I'm not an extrovert. I'm not an expressive person, and I'm not, um, uh, um, I I've seen young people who are sort of introverted, and youth group spirituality tends to be very extroverted, yeah. and expressive, and mm -hmm. happy clappy, and you know, chipper. And, and I see introverted young people who look at that and say, I can't be that. Not me. Mm -hmm. And therefore, but they think that's what a Christian is. Right. And so they're like, well, I can't make this stuff up all the time. I'm, I can't be on all the time. Mm -hmm. And so you give them something like the Book of Common Prayer, and, I, and you say, this is the gift of yeah. tongues. <laughs> <laughs> Here, God is giving you the words of his scripture to pray. Yeah. That's right. And a regimen, and, just, and you see these lights go on, yeah. and it's like, you mean I don't have to sort of be this chipper, perky, on mm -hmm. person? I can be in Christ and being... In, immersed in these practices. And in lots of ways, you know, disciplines like that take you through the whole council of scripture yeah. in ways that my own little personal supplications don't. And they become more formative. Yeah, yeah. Trains run better on tracks than they do on, on the ground. That's a great metaphor. And, and the uh, wheel has been invented. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. And right. it's round. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. But you are touching on something that maybe some people hearing this uh, interview uh, would be very unfamiliar with, and which is kind of these repeated liturgical practices mm -hmm. week in and week out. And the, um, the sense is that this is going to lead to a kind of deadening or routine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, th there seems to be some kind of allergy to repetition in, um, in some contemporary churches. And you've already in part said, well, you know, one of the goods of this repetition is sometimes you need to be carried. Yes. In this. Yes. You know, right. because not every day can we muster the, um, the love and affection and, um, um, and kind of energy. So, so these things carry us. But talk a little bit more about this kind of allergy to repetition among some contemporary churches and, you know, why we need not fear it, why in fact it is um, this real gift of formation. Well, and I, and I yeah, great question. Um, my concern is, is that if we don't come up with a positive account of repetition and why repetition is a good thing spiritually, we will just keep being deformed by secular liturgies because they get it's how important repetition is. It's a tournament of liturgies. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. <laughs> That's and, great. And, and I think this is where the psychology or neuroscience would sort of nourish the account that we're giving here, which is, look, your, your sort of intuitions and perception of the world are ingrained in you because you are immersed in practices over time and that starts to seep into your unconscious. And um, so how ironic then that Christians, somehow we've decided that novelty in worship is the most important thing. So what are we gonna do next week to make it interesting and not boring? And I think that's because we've assumed that worship is just an expressive activity by which we show our devotion to God, and we've missed the formative part that no, this is how God is getting a hold of us. So there is no formation where there is no repetition. Can I talk about that from neuropsych just a little bit? So the, when I go to these neuropsych conferences, they say the, the um, neurons that fire together wire together. And so they fire and it's the repetitive firing that then makes the neural nets that sets up the practices. So for example, stupid example, but when you 
put on your pants in the morning. You don't think like a little toddler does. Okay, I sit down, I try to hold it open. I try to put, you know, we pick up our jeans and we always put the one leg in first. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a motor program, we don't think of it. It's like when you're driving a stick shift, you know, when you started, it was, I'm gonna put in the clutch and now I'm gonna slowly, you know. But now mm -hmm. we just get in, we start the car and we go. Yep. Because it's a motor program. Yes. So what you're talking about is motor programs of worship that take care of us having to painfully think about it and make the decision every yeah. time. Yeah. But motor programs of worship that just, ha, ah, now I'm in his presence and I can bring my stuff. Yes. Yeah. And, and, um, and it's not just so that you can show that you're that kind of automaton or something. The point is you're being immersed in those practices over and over again so that the spirit can be transforming how now you act in the world, right? right. So that when you do have to think right. about things, it's already informed by the background imagination and perception that you've acquired through those repeated right. practices. Yeah, I, I think it's puzzling. I think lots of Christians affirm repetition in all kinds of other spheres of their cultural life, whether they're musicians, athletes, teachers, whatever it might be. Um, and then somehow we think repetition is illegitimate in the spiritual realm. But as you have pointed out already, that's, that's a very modern, Do new maybe, idea. Maybe it's one of the lies of the enemy. Well, uh, I, could, I could imagine a screw tape letter on exactly this point. Convince Christians that they need to keep doing it differently. Yes. Well, right. I, think you, I, think, I think you say in one of your books that, you know, don't let the enemy have all the good repetition. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, let me yeah. ask you, too, about, um, you know, I want to ask a little bit about higher education and seminaries. Yeah. Because, of course, um, the pastors of our churches uh, right. come out of higher education settings. Yep in many cases, seminaries. And seminaries, or just like, uh, just like classroom learning in, in all colleges, has a kind of uh, very basic liturgy of walk in, sit down, listen to a lecture, have a discussion, take notes. It is a kind of a brain on the stick model, and I know there's more creative pedagogical practices. Mm -hmm. But this is the training ground for people, including pastors. Mm -hmm. And you know, let's face it, people tend to run their churches as pastors, kind of how they were taught mm -hmm. in seminaries. So if there is kind of a default tendency toward the brain on the stick model for churches, it could be that that was learned in seminaries. And so my question is, do the traditional liturgies of the classroom, of higher education, or any place Christians are being formed in a college classroom, do those need to start changing? And, and how would you say they need to change? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, on the one hand, of course, a Christian university and a seminary are not the church. So it's fair enough to say, you know, the, they are intellectual institutions. They, they are defined by yeah. that project of research and learning and exploration. The, that, however, doesn't settle the pedagogical... Well, and, and pragmatically speaking, you know, well, they, well, pastors should separate those things. They may just go on and... That's, that make could that very well. They may make the right. church a kind of little university. Right. So right. go on. Right. Yeah. No. 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 That's that. right. That's right. <laughs> and and it's funny because some pe some readers of my work worry that I'm trying to make the university into a big church. So that's why I Are sometimes you? no. I mean, what I do want to, I want to see the 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 university and the seminary as embedded institutions within the church's life. So these are the places we come to think. Thinking is good, right? But I think now what we need to ask ourselves is what would be the practices and ethos of those institutions that would equip us to think well and love well <laughs> and, and, and to have our habits shaped. And um, I think we are just starting to have that conversation. How would the ethos of a Christian university or seminary change if it was also going to be a formative space and not just an informative space. So what I am hearing, it sounds like there is space for a conversation to happen at universities and seminaries about what other practices could be admitted. Because it seems to me that, um, you know, especially in, in undergraduate colleges, uh, Christian colleges, I mean, students are living together, they are eating together, they're worshiping together, they're learning together. Um, that these are, and these are all parts of an education that you need to be taken seriously. Uh, because these are a, a kind of um, constellation of practices um, that they're getting. Totally. And so uh, my, my concern is that uh, we need to train students even at this educational level yes. 
in all of these because they inevitably will kind of teach as they have been taught. That's right. Yes, and, and it's, I agree, um, both college and seminary are such fantastic seasons of life to invite students to try on new practices, which then you hope take and, and will continue to shape them for a lifetime. And um, I think we need to be much more intentional. It's why, it's why the Student Affairs Division and the Academic Division have to be in sync and feeding and fueling one another. Which has not traditionally been the model. Often spiritual formation, yeah. while theology has been discussed in the classroom, yes. spiritual formation or spiritual life has been outsourced yes. Yes. to the co-curricular. Yep. Yep. As if... Well, that has to do more with practices right. and the heart and things like this. And, and, and that's my concern is that this kind of distinction that we've somehow inherited, I think it goes back to the, uh, the, modern, the modernist university yeah. Yeah. and kind of sending theology down the road. Well, um, and this is why the pre-modern university is another just resource for us. So if you go back to, right. um, you know, think of how the University of Paris or Oxford or Cambridge began. They bubbled up out of monastic communities, That's right. do you know what I mean? That's they were right. spaces of a holistic community of practice in which then was embedded intellectual investigation. Because I think you're right, we, we don't want to compartmentalize this or bifurcate it. Um, you also, sometimes the piety and spirituality that is fostered in the extracurricular undercuts the intellectual project, right? I've seen that happen. Mm -hmm. So there's no extracurricular. There's just co-curricular. And all of that has to be framed towards the end of loving God and loving learning for God's sake. Yeah, the first Timothy 1 5, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart. My question is, does that apply to the university yes. as well as the church? It was yes. written to the Council of Churches. Absolutely. Oh, okay, question. and my question is, what about if your university is your computer yeah. and you're doing distance learning? which is a wonderful and horrible opportunity for us. <laughs> and we have to do it. Right, right. It is, and, and, and there will be people we can reach that with a Christian university that otherwise would never have this. Yeah. And yet, it seems to me anytime we put something online, we are making every mm. single one of our students learning disabled mm. because now they're isolated in some way. Mm. Mm. And they aren't, it's not a breath relationship. And so how do we do formation yeah, it's a, online? It's a mode of learning that is almost de facto about information transfer, yep. right? And as you say, if you're comparing that to nothing, it's a benefit. It is. <laughs> if you're comparing that to the full-orbed formational communal project that we know as traditional residential undergraduate liberal arts education, it's hard to kind of imagine those two things side by side. The one innovation I have heard of that, that tries to at least honor this challenge is looking for ways to let online learners in other places find one another for communities of yes. practice. Mm -hmm. and, yes. and or finding congregations and communities that will basically host peer learning groups yes. that make this more embodied, more communal, more practiced. Um, you could imagine, for example, that everyone in our class, even though we're all across the country and around the globe, we nonetheless actually commit to certain practices, yes. say, of morning and evening prayer. Yes. And even though we are isolated, in common, we are praying the divine hours or something yes. like that. That's, again, I'm not convinced that that's the ideal, but maybe in the real, that's not a bad strategy yeah. of, yeah. of response. Right. We've, we've talked about, you know, for our spiritual formation classes, if we, as we put them online, you know, sending along a light this candle, smell this incense, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, get down on your knees, mm -hmm. and now we're going to all pray together, right. you know, in that kind of instant Skype yeah. networking yeah. way yeah. that we can do. It does show the challenge, <laughs> though, doesn't it, of the kind of cultural liturgies of media and communication, yeah. that there's some, sometimes they are just loaded to be reductionistic, right? And they right. ironically reduce us to minds yes. that yeah. connect online, yeah. um, even though we are obviously bodies. But they may awaken desire. Yes, mm -hmm. I Which agree. then 
agree. this person will go out and find the church Absolutely. wherever they are. This is why the intellectual project is so crucial. I mean, what, what the other thing that's going on at, uh, in an education is you are actually inviting people to think about the practices that they are immersed in so that they can then have new intentionality. Mm -hmm. What communities of practice do you want to shape you? Yeah. Or what communities of practice have you been immersed in that you didn't realize were communities yes. of practice yes. yeah. and were functioning liturgically? That's an intellectual insight yeah. that is part of a Christian education. Yeah. That's right. One of the temptations I find, uh, even with talking to people online, if I'm Skyping or other things, is it seems like the online screen, which is usually filled with links. Yes. Links say you can go elsewhere if you're bored for a moment. Mm. So you can leave this. So the screen almost intuitively, even as I approach it, I feel my body, if I'm bored for a second, mm -hmm. I'll get to leave and go someplace more exciting. Mm -hmm. Facebook. Yeah, yeah. And, so, <laughs> and, and so that is gonna be the one temptation, even as yeah. we kind of create a kind of interpersonal experience on computers, um, while I may walk away from somebody in person, and that would be pretty rude, yeah. <laughs> there is kind of this extra temptation on a screen that has formed me sure. habitually sure. to want to go elsewhere. Sure. In a moment, so. And yeah. so how do we form ourselves to check in with the Holy Spirit, even in front of the screen, and saying, yeah. Lord, what do you have for me right now? You're yeah. with me in this body. Yep. Mm -hmm. What do you have yeah. for me right now? Well, and, it, and there could be very concrete institutional architecture that, that frames it so that, for example, you kind of eliminate those temptations in your online right. interface. Yeah. Right? Cool. It, it's kind of, I, I'm kind of, pro-paternalism in some of these respects. It's what Cass Sunstein calls nudging. Nudging is where you basically set up institutional spaces that just kind of constrain your choice architecture, but it's for your good, right? And so then you're sort of propelled. Otherwise, again, we're thrown back on the individual willpower. Um, and I don't have that. I, I need the spirit and I need the community to help me live yeah. this out. You know what I really like about the conversation we've had is that um, you've, in a sense, expanded the options. So much of, of, mm, of uh, mm. kind of explorations in, in, in uh, church uh, work and growth is kind of saying, well, it's just, this, it's just this piece here that you're missing, this piece here. But you've kind of returned us to some ancient wisdom. Mm. You've kind of returned us to the reality of how God actually made us, uh, not just as minds, but as bodies and as uh, sensations and as affect. Mm. And you've actually kind of taken some of the... Um, some of the work that's being done in general revelation, in neuroscience, yeah. in psychology, in sociology, and you said, you know, if this helps us understand what it means to be human before God, then we need to appropriate this Absolutely. for our purposes. So I feel like this discussion has really expanded our imagination Great. for how God shapes us. So Great. thank you. I've for, enjoyed it. Thank you for helping. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. It was great fun.